So I'm very happy to be here today. Um, and just a, a quick story. Um, there's some people here who had a big impact on the, the path that I, that I ended up on. Uh, when I was 16, I read an article in Skeptic Magazine about uh, Max Moore and the Extropians. And uh, it was that article that got me interested in a lot of these topics. And I saved up my money, and um, I went to the next ex uh, Extropy conference. And there I met Andrew Sandberg. And we had a really fascinating conversation about neuroscience. And that was that, it was that conversation that um, drove me into uh, the line of inquiry that I've been following for the last uh, you know, 16 years or so. And so um, a lot of what I'm showing you is part of a, a, longer, uh, a longer vision that I have for, for neuroscience and cryonics. Um, and one of the things that I got out of my conversation with Anders is that uh, neuroscience is um, a really data constrained um, field. And one of the biggest things that uh, sort of neuroscience and, and the, the larger community that's trying to understand uh, human cognition and neural computation, one of the biggest needs they had was um, just more data. Uh, specifically, um, I chose to take up uh, large scale imaging projects um, as a way to increase our knowledge about uh, how the brain works. From the cryonics perspective, um, one of the big questions that I have, um, and, it's a, and it's a question that, that, that hasn't been answered, is um, what, what do we actually need to preserve to have some reasonable confidence that the information that's encoded in our brains is actually making it uh, into the doers? Um, and it's a, it's a very, that's a very hard question to answer, and even you know, conventional neuroscience has not solidly nailed neural encoding, and so even the, even the best scientists today in conventional laboratories couldn't give a, um, a clear answer to that. We do have something going for us, which is neural encoding takes place at multiple levels of abstraction and is redundant. And so I've listed a few, um, a few neural encoding skills. Um, you have uh, issues of connectivity, and Sebastian Sung, who's speaking next, is going to go into this in detail. You also have um, you know, the synapses, what type they are, how dense they are. They're, um, uh, different proteins that that um, that are that are modified to to change the, how the circuits behave. Um, there are issues of um, you know is gene expression important? Uh, are the ionic concentrations important? Um, I I've taken a big interest in uh, in uh, neural structure, um, and and specifically um, light microscopy. Now. Um, I don't think that light microscopy is everything that we're going to need to, to really understand a reverse engineer neural, neural computation, um, but it has the benefit of being high throughput as compared to uh, electron uh, techniques. And so uh, microscopy hasn't changed all that much in the last, um, you know, 100 years. Um, Ramon Cajal at the top uh, looked, looked through a microscope and, uh, and, tra and, and drew the, the neurons that he saw. And microscopists today and pathologists today um, largely do the same kind of work, where they look at two-dimensional representations of the of the cell of uh, cell tissues and organs. And so, the the project that I've been working on for the last few years um, is trying to change how we do high throughput three D microscopy. And so, usually with with microscopy, you take a slice off of a piece of tissue, you put it on a glass slide, you put the slide into a microscope, and you take a picture. Um, what we're doing is uh, we are imaging the tissue while we're slicing it. And so from a, like a sci-fi perspective, this is a, a destructive brain scanner. And so how it works, you, this is a, a diagram uh, from the patent, um, which I think is, is fairly clear. You have the block of tissue underneath, and then um, this structure right here is a diamond knife. And what we do is we use the knife as part of the optics train. And so we put light through the back of the knife. And then the objective is focused on the bevel of the knife right there, and, and there's a, a camera on the backside um, that's recording a line of pixels on the bevel of the knife. And then we image continuously while we slice. And so that, that allows us to um, not have to do any manual handling of the tissue. And so we can load in a block of tissue, and it can image, and it, it can image completely automated um, until it gets to the end of the block. And so that spits out um, two-dimensional images like this. And so this is a, a Golgi stain, and that's a cell body there. And these are these are dendrites, and that's probably an axon. And, it, we, and then we take a we get a stack of these images, and then we tr and we algorithmically trace those structures across. And so this is a 
uh, a Golgi stain. I'll show you some more data in a second, but here's the cell body. Um, there's the, uh, the dendritic arbor. The thing this allows us to do is image very quickly. Um, so right now, we're mostly looking at ma uh, uh, mouse brains. And so uh, a mouse brain is about a trillion cubic microns, uh, and we're imaging about 10 million voxels per second. And so right now, we're, we can image a mouse brain in about a day. Um, and we've just built a new version of our microscope, which we call the KESM, which can, can image a, a 5 by 5 by 5 uh, centimeter cube, uh, which means we can start getting uh, small primate brains in there. Um, to do a human brain with our current imaging rates would be a bit of a challenge. Uh, a human brain is about a, quadr a quadrillion microns, uh, and so it'd be, be about three and a half years of imaging to do a single human brain at the resolution that we're working with. Now, we, we, think, we're, we think we can redesign it to, to up the imaging, and um, in, in the coming months and the, the coming year, we're gonna be redesigning, trying to, uh, to get that speed up. Um, th this, is, this is the current iteration of the microscope. Um, so that's our couch. Um, this, is the, uh, th this is the stage that we use. It's, uh, it's from aerospace uh, manufacturing. It's used to position parts um, for like uh, high precision CNCs. It has an um, XYZ resolution of about 100 nanometers. And we have it uh, hooked up to the computer. And so then the, the tissue sits in this water bath here. And uh, these cables that you see going into it, those are fiber optics that bring light to the back of the knife. There's a microscope objective, and you can't see it, but d deep down in there is a diamond knife. And then this is our, our optics train and the imaging sensor on the back side, which dumps data back over to the computer. And this is the kind of data that we get out of it. So these are, um, uh, these are uh, capillaries. And so what you're seeing here is the microvasculature. And so these filaments are about eight microns across. And so we're zoomed in over here all the way down to a cell level. Um, and so at this resolution, you could pick out cell bodies. And the, on the right-hand side, this is zoomed all the way up to a macro view. And so the, the important thing that we can do is we can go from cell level resolution um, all the way out to uh, whole brain scales. And um, we're, we're interested in vasculature for a variety of reasons. Um, we're looking at, at applying this technology to um, you know, looking at, uh, let's say, like cancer vasculature. But, um, but it doesn't get us exactly what I want for, um, for, my, for trying to understand neuroscience. So th this is another stain that we work with. Uh, this is a Nissel stain, which stains the cell bodies. And so you see on the right, this is the, the cell level resolution. And so we're zooming up and down through this cube. And each of those uh, dark gray areas are, um, are the, the body of a neuron. It doesn't get us any of the neurofilaments or connectivity, um, but it is really useful for doing things like cell body distributions. And so then on the, on the, on the left-hand side, or your right, um, is the, uh, the whole brain um, done in Nissel stain. And so anywhere in this brain, you can go in and you can zoom down and see cell level features. Um, the thing I'm really interested in is neural connectivity and uh, um, the neurofilament morphology. And so this is, a, um, this is with a, a silver nitrate stain or a Golgi stain. Uh, and what that does, it stains about 1% of the neurons in, uh, in a volume. And so what you can see here is the dark blobs are cell, are cell bodies. And these longer filaments going this direction are the axons. And then the, the sort of the mess of smaller filaments coming out of the backside, those are the dendrites. Um, and the thing that gets me excited about this kind of data is we can trace these structures out, and we can look at how the, how the circuitry connects to each other. This doesn't give, give us everything. Um, for instance, um, just very specifically, this is 1% of the neurons in there. There's another 99% of the neurons that you can't see because we had to establish a foreground and a background. Um, to get the information that I'm really interested in, we have to move to electron, electron, micro, uh, electron scales, um, which we mentioned in the next talk. Um, the reason that I am not approaching that directly is the scan rates uh, at the real high resolution aren't, lar aren't fast enough to do really large volumes like whole brains. And so we still have uh, more, te more technological progress that's ne that needs to happen before we can really get the, the whole brain uh, volumes at the resolution that we're really interested in. And then I couldn't get these to embed. So let's do this. 
So th these are more neural reconstructions. And so these are Purkinje cells in the cerebellum. The reason I like to show these cells um, is that Purkinje cells have a really distinct uh, dendritic arborization. And so um, basically the, the dendrites have a, a planar structure. Uh, and so what you can see, you can see these, these dendrites, um, they're all in plane with each other. And, and this has to do with uh, how the cerebellum uh, integrates and, and computes information. And so I usually show this because uh, neuroscientists uh, are usually very familiar with uh, Purkinje cells and their architecture, and they can see that so they can see that this looks the way that one would expect Purkinje cells to look. And this is from this is a data from um, from that same brain of the the previous um, slide I just showed you. Um, one of the big challenges in, in this case is data. Um, the amount of data this produces is very large. So each uh, each mouse brain, which is about a cubic centimeter, is about a, a terabyte of imagery. And so one of the challenges that we face is how do we, how do we process and, and do reconstructions of very fine, complex structures across terabytes of imagery. So those, that, those are Purkinje cells. Um, this is from the same brain. This is in the cortex. And so these are pyramidal cells. And so right there is the cell body. And these are the axons uh, that you can see going up. And so um, the, the cortex is a little bit hard to um, structurally to pick, to pick apart unless you look at it a lot. Um, but the, the structures in here generally look like the way you would expect um, the cortex to look. And this, this is from the, from the, same, uh, the same brain of, of the previous two samples that I showed you. And so you can get some sense of how complex um, of structures we actually need to uh, pick apart and reconstruct in, in these images. And so we, we haven't done um, large-scale re algorithmic reconstructions of, of the uh, neurons yet, but we have done some work with vasculature. And I'm going to show this to you to sort of give you an idea of the directions that we're going. So this is a 3D reconstruction of uh, microvasculature. And so, the, and so um, these aren't raster representations. Um, th this, you know, this has been put into a database. And we can do a visualization now where we, where we color code the um, microvasculature based on the radius of the microvasculature. So, so the, 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 the blue and the green are, are, the, are, the, are the, the larger vessels. And then it goes to orange and red as it, get, as it gets thinner. What's, um, what's less visually impressive, but I think more exciting, is that once you have the, this morphology in the database, you can start doing quantitative analysis on it. So at the top, there's a table. Um, where we've taken three brain regions uh, and we've computed a, nu um, a number of things about the vasculature in those areas. So the number of vascular se segments, the total length of the vasculature, the surface area, the volume. And um, with these quantitative analysis, um, by using quantitative analysis, you can uh, start comparing things uh, in ways that previously you were relying on pathologists to uh, visually and qualitatively make decisions about what was going on in the tissue. So um, this is an ongoing project. Um, right now we are um, we're rebuilding the entire system from the ground up. Actually, we, we've rebuilt it from the ground up, um, uh, increasing the overall throughput and the total volume that we can fit into it. We're also adding um, fluorescence and developing the neural reconstruction algorithms. Um, what we're working on next is we're going to be um, figuring out how to get um, more immunohistochemistry uh, involved in our projects. And also, we're working ways to, um, uh, to do our embedding so that we can turn samples around faster. Um, a lot of this technology, the intersection with cryonics is somewhere down the road. Um, I think there are things that. There are things that I'm already starting to think about, about how is this going to change um, how cryonics works. And one is, um, just to start off, is um, we, can, we can quantitatively uh, reconstruct uh, whole organ structures. And I think that this might be useful uh, for evaluating uh, cryonics procedures in a research setting. And then uh, a little bit less direct, um, increasing the 
uh, the, the, the level of knowledge that neuroscience has about neural structure and neural function, I think actually is a huge benefit to cryonics because we don't know exactly how um, the revival scenarios are going to work, but there are some revival scenarios such as uploading where um, we're not going to try and do biological revival. We're going to try and uh, move, fr move from one substrate to another. Um, and if neuroscience, but in order to do that, neuroscience has to really deeply understand how, um, how neurons work and how to represent them. And so a lot of the work that we're doing trying to intersect with more conventional neuroscience uh, is to try and drive the kinds of neuroscience research and the kind of neuroscience data that I think is going to be necessary to do things, to do things like uploading. And it's on the, on the evaluation side, on the research side, I think these things are, are fairly important. So this is research done, um, done by a scientist um, named Bourne. Um, and what they did is they took, um, so they were studying uh, long-term potentiation and synapse uh, distribution. And what, in, in one of their papers, they mentioned sort of in a, on a side note, this uh, methodological uh, approach they're taking. Um, usually, people in this field, they would take and they would do a perfusion fixation of the neural tissue. Um, th what this group did is they, they, um, they realized some of the same things that we in the cryonics community recognize, which things like temperature matter. Uh, and so they started um, controlling temperature and keeping the samples cool while they were doing the perfusions. And, and then they went and they did um, electron micrograph reconstructions of the neurofilaments and started looking at the synaptic densities. And if you look over, over here on, on this side, this bar graph, you can see that the um, the samples that were kept cold during the perfusion had a higher density of spines per micron as compared to the normal perfused or the room temperature slices. And so um, measures like this, I think, down the road could be very useful in cryonics for doing uh, evaluation of procedures with um, uh, in, in ways that are uh, very relevant to information encoding. Um, and something that I'd like to see at some point is um, taking cryopreserved tissue and doing, uh, doing reconstructions of the, of the synaptic densities uh, and then comparing it, to, uh, comparing, comparing it to normal tissue because this would allow us to have greater confidence that the, that the information structures that are, um, that, that are being captured by cryonics are sufficient to um, capture that information. Um, earlier this week, I sat down and went through um, some uh, contemporary cryobiology research, looking for things that I thought were interesting, where I might want to um, where I might want to engage the technology that we're working on. And so I found uh, um, th this is a zebrafish eye, and so these are um, immunohistochemistry stains on zebrafish, and so they're taking they're comp they're looking at uh, cryo sections and cryo preserved um, zebrafish, and the really the relevant thing is that. Uh, immunohistochemistry stands, and you can use in, immunohistochemistry uh, interrogations to pull out um, information about the, the distribution of proteins in a particular sample. And I think that it'd be very exciting at some point to uh, start using stains like this on the vitrified or cryopreserved tissue, because if it turns out that um, neuroscience says that the distribution of proteins inside of a neural volume is critically important to extracting the information that's there, then I would like to be able to, to look and see whether or not the, the excellent work that's being done by 21st century medicine and Alcor and others in, in developing these protocols, whether or not those, distribu those distributions of proteins holds um, across the um, different uh, cryopreservation protocols. Um, th this, this is a, an, another slide um, from, a, from another researcher um, where they looked at, where they were comparing uh, vitrified, frozen, and fresh tissue on, in different stains. So the, the first column is a fairly standard um, H&E stain, um, which isn't that exciting, but these, these two other columns are immunohistochemistry stains. And so I was very happy to see that, um, at least in this particular laboratory setting, that, I mean, that immunohistochemistry, immunohistochemistry, IHC, that IHC was, was holding, um, and um, it's, 
makes me want to start using IHC on, on cryopreserved tissue that's being done uh, by Alcor um, to see, you know, how does it look? Are, are, are the proteins that are embedded in that tissue, do they look the way that we would want them to look to have confidence that the information is being uh, captured? Um, this, this is a, um, over lunch, uh, there was a discussion of, um, synap of synapses and how do we know that synapses are, are surviving through. And so there are, there are um, antibody synapse stains. This is a, a synapsin stain. And so this, this layer of red um, is, uh, I actually can't remember which chunk of tissue this is, but in this tissue, you can see the distribution of synapses. I think it would be very interesting to take the work that's being done by Alcor and to look and see, are we seeing normal synapse distribution, or are these things disappearing? Um, one, of the, one of the important uh, aspects of understanding um, biological control is looking at gene expression. And so um, this, this slide is from a group called the Allen Brain Atlas, uh, and you can actually go online and look at this. They use a technique called in situ hybridization um, to stain for gene expression in brain tissue. It's a really exciting project. Um, they started off with, um, with mouse brains, and then they moved to developing mice brains, uh, and then now they have actually a, a human project where they're doing large-scale imaging of gene expression uh, in human brains. And it would be very interesting to take um, brains that are preserved using the cryonics protocols and start comparing them to uh, the gene expression profiles that, um, that the Allen Brain Atlas is getting. And so I don't have a whole lot of answers because this is a sort of a very new and, and um, yet to be developed field, but uh, going forward, the things that I'm really inter interested in are, are the connectivity, how, looking at synapses, looking at proteins, and perhaps even gene expression. Um, just as a side note, I don't think it's likely that we need to get down to the level of looking at ionic concentration because I think that the, the information that's encoded there, the time scales are very short, and the things that matter are getting integrated up and expressed in other systems. And so I think that we can probably cut off um, our, our sort of criteria somewhere around the, the, the protein distribution level. Probably you don't need to worry about phosphorylation. But these, these are open-ended these are open-ended questions, um, and I'm pretty excited to see how uh, neuroscience and cryonics develop um, to answering it. And so, just as, as a quick thanks, um, I'm supported by a really awesome team, uh, and uh, financially by Breakout Labs, which is um, part of the Teal Foundation. And I'm not. I'm not sure if there's time for questions. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions. It depends on what you mean by damage. Um, it is destructive in that you start off with a whole piece of tissue, and then at the end of it, you have basically, um, like for a mouse brain, we, we take a whole mouse brain and turn it into a kilometer long micron thin ribbon. Um, and so you're not gonna be able to uh, glue those back together. Um, there are still things that are contained inside of that. Um, a, a lot of the, the molecular structure is still there. And so, um, so if, what you, if what you wanted to do was to take, um, to take that ribbon that comes off and image it with other imaging modalities, you could probably do that. If you wanted to take and you wanted to interrogate it molecularly with uh, microarrays or some other array-based technology, you could also do that. Um, but you're not definitely not going to be able to uh, sort of Humpty Dumpty uh, put the brain back together again. It's pretty small. Um, we can definitely trace the structures across. Um, the, um, the things that make it hard for us to do the tracing are not the damage that we're doing to the tissue. Uh, it's more the signal to noise ratios of the foreground and background. And then also that neurons, neurons are the most complex 3D cellular structure 
um, of a single cell in all of biology. And so the features that, that were the features that we're reconstructing are right at the limits of what you can image with the wavelength of light. And so um, that's what makes our life difficult. The, the actual damage in between the slices is trivial. It, it's, it's continuous. So we have, we have the block, and we take a slice off, and then we stop imaging and then retract it. Um, we could, we're, we're considering moving to a rotary um, base where, where we have brains on a spit and then the knife coming in because that would be, we'd be imaging, you know, closer to 100% of the time with that. Uh, yeah, so, um, so the, the, the photograph, the photograph is being taken continuously down the, down the uh, block. And so uh, if we put on an XYZ coordinate system, your X would be the position down the knife, your Y would be the position of the knife down the, down the face of the block, and your Z will be your slice number. Is that, what, is that the question? Or? Yeah, it, it, it's, if, you, if you wanted to put together a bunch of words on it, it's like a, a, an automated serial um, line scan transmission microscope. The, the, the camera and the knife are fixed relative to each other, and we move the tissue. So what's that? I, I, I couldn't hear the question. Yeah, the, there, there, are a number of art, there are a number of issues in traditional light microscopy that we're trying to deal with. One is traditional, traditional microscopy is really slow. Um, you, I don't think that anyone has ever considered doing micron thick sections of a mouse brain and imaging it with a traditional um, like slide scanner system. The other thing that we do, and this is a, a, little, a little subtle, but um, when you're taking off um, micron thick sections from a block, the tissue that comes off is very fragile. And then you're manipulating that tissue onto a glass slide. And so there's a lot of distortion. And so when you take and you have a series of these, the, the microstructures aren't aligned relative to each other. There's been warping. And so there's a computational process where you have the rubber sheet those back onto each other, and that's a, a very hard computational problem. The way that we're doing the imaging, since we record it right as it comes off of the block face, um, there hasn't been a chance, you, the tissue hasn't undergone that warping, and so the, the image stacks that we get are um, come in perfectly aligned, and we don't have to go through that uh, process of fixing the data up and cleaning it up and uh, getting everything lined up on a micro scale. So right now, uh, we use um, resin embedding. So we, we embed the tissues in a polymer. And that, makes, that fixes everything structurally in place so that, it can, so that it can hold up to the knife. And so we can get slices that thin. Um, we are interested in developing other embedding techniques. Like I'm actually very interested in um, developing a, a version of the knife that works at cold temperatures um, because I'm very interested in using cold to stiffen the tissue so that we can use less, dis so that we can use a wider range of uh, embedding media. What's the biggest bottleneck in terms of being able to go faster? Um, there are a few bottlenecks. Uh, w one is right now actually um, uh, diamonds. They're expensive and hard to work with. And so uh, there are only a couple companies in the world that produce uh, custom diamond blades. And so, um, and, and so the, the width of the knife is one of the things that determines our throughput. Uh, once we get uh, past that, uh, op um, optics um, are usually designed to sort of look in a circle. We only want to look in, in a line. And so there are not a lot of off-the-shelf optics that are tuned to what we're concerned with. And so to increase our throughput, um, we're probably going to start working with diamonds more directly ourselves rather than uh, buying them from a, uh, a producer. And then we're also going to, at some point, have to redo our whole optics train um, and get it tuned specifically um, to what we're doing. But if we, 
if we redo the knives and redo the optics, we can increase our throughput by an order of magnitude. But both of those tasks are like a half million dollars at least uh, per task to re-engineer to, um, to re those. 